Join me tonight on Twitch at 11.30 p.m. Eastern after the conclusion of Sunday Night Football, where we'll talk about everything that happened this week in the NFL. And join me Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern to play some live NFL trivia for a chance to win cash prizes. Link in the description below. And now, on with our feature presentation. Winning a game in the NFL is hard. When you're a head coach and you win a game, it means you have the right game plan to counter the opposing team. You put in the work beforehand, you made some great decisions during the game, and you put your players in position to perform at the highest level possible. Awful coaching can lose games, and amazing coaching can win games. I think that goes without saying. And that's what makes this story all the more remarkable. Marv Levy is considered by many to be one of the greatest coaches of all time, and might be the greatest coach since the merger to never win a Super Bowl. He's in the Hall of Fame for a reason. Including the playoffs, Levy ended his storied career with 154 wins. Picking out the easiest one of these wins is a tall order. But in 1986, Marv Levy won a game where he literally did nothing. He called no plays. He looked at no game film. Whatever the bare minimum a head coach is supposed to do, he somehow did less than that. And yet, Levy got the win. This is the story of what has to be the easiest game of Marv Levy's career. Before I talk about the game in question, we need some context to understand how the Bills were playing up until that point, as well as why Levy literally did not do any coaching whatsoever in preparation for the game. Our story begins a decade prior all the way back in 1978, when the Kansas City Chiefs hired a coach out of the CFL named Marv Levy to become the new man in charge. In five seasons with the Montreal Alouettes, Levy won two great cups and made it to a third. The Chiefs were looking for a new coach who could bring back the glory days of the American Football League. The team hadn't made the postseason since 1971, and hadn't had a winning record since 1973. After the Hank Stram reign came to an end, neither Paul Wiggin nor Tom Bettis could get the job done, and so the Chiefs brought in Levy to right the ship. That did not happen. Levy was the head coach of the Chiefs for five seasons, and in those five years, he compiled a pretty poor record of 31-42. and 42. Not once did the Chiefs finish the season in the postseason, and only once in 1981 did Kansas City have a winning record, when they went 9-7. and seven. In all five seasons, the Chiefs finished in the bottom half of the league in total yards, including a season in 1980 when they were dead last, and after a disastrous 1982 season, where the Chiefs looked incredibly unprepared following the strike and dropped their first four games coming back from the two-month intermission, Levy was let go as the team's head coach. After leaving the Chiefs, Levy kept himself occupied with other gigs around professional football. He was the head coach of the Chicago Blitz in the United States Football League during the 1984 season, though his team finished that season with the worst record in the Western Conference, going just 5-13 over the 18-game season. He rejoined the Alouettes and served as the team's director of football operations. And during the preseason, he would serve as the color commentator on broadcast for the Buffalo Bills, which would explain the connection that Levy had with the organization before the move that would eventually happen midway through the 1986 campaign. Levy was keeping himself busy, but he wasn't an NFL head coach. Midway through 1986, however, that would change. It's hard to exaggerate just how bad the Bills were in the middle of the 1980s once Chuck Knox left. The team was 2-14 in 1984, but for some reason, decided to keep Case Stevenson on board as the head coach in 1985. That backfired, as Stevenson lost his first four games of the 1985 season and was replaced by Hank Bulla. Even though Bulla didn't do much better, as the Bills went 2-10 in the 12 games under him, the Bills surprised just about everyone by removing the interim tag from his head coaching position and making him the full-time coach. It made about as much sense as the last time the Bills tried that, when Jim Ringo was 0-9 in 1976 and somehow stayed on for another season. I talked about that in a previous video of mine, so if you want to learn more about that bizarre situation, then click the card in the upper right corner. At least in 1986, the Bills finally had Jim Kelly playing for them under center. Kelly was drafted by the Bills in the first round of the 1983 NFL Draft but he didn't play for three years because he decided to spurn the NFL for the Houston Gamblers of the USFL. Surely Kelly would make the Bills competitive and get them out of the basement of the AFC East, right? Not quite. The first half of 1986 was a disaster, as the team started off 2-7 through their first nine games, and there were some really bad losses in there. A three-point overtime loss to the Cincinnati Bengals where the Bills led by double digits in the fourth quarter, only to completely choke the game away. A loss to the Kansas City Chiefs where they led 17-10 in the fourth quarter, only to allow 10 on answer to lose it. A loss to the New York Jets where the Bills led 13-7 in the fourth quarter, only for the Jets to go on a game-winning touchdown drive late and win it. There's a theme here in case you haven't been able to tell. I think the best way to describe Hank Bullock's time with the Bills is this actual quote that he said toward the end of 1985, when he said, We keep beating ourselves, but we're getting better at it. And after nine games, owner Ralph Wilson had seen enough. He fired Bulla and replaced him with none other than Marv Levy. The organization knew Levy from his years serving as the color commentator on preseason broadcasts. General Manager Bill Polian knew Levy from his time with the Chiefs, where Polian was a scout on Levy's staff. And Levy had previously applied for the position in 1983 when Chuck Knox left the team to join the Seattle Seahawks. Levy and the Bills were familiar with each other, and Levy was thrilled to be getting another opportunity to become a head coach in the league. 
saying, I probably know the Bills better than any team in the NFL by virtue of doing the preseason games. I've got a pretty good line on their personnel, their strengths, and their weaknesses. So what was Levy's grand plan to start off? How was he going to put his stamp on the team? He was going to start off by doing absolutely nothing. Before going any further, I want to stress the fact that hiring Levy in the first place was a bit of a weird decision. It wasn't that Levy wasn't qualified, it wasn't that Levy didn't deserve a second chance, and it wasn't even that Levy didn't know anyone in the organization, because that's not true, as he had plenty of ties to the Bills. It was the fact that he was hired in the middle of the season as, for all intents and purposes, an outsider. You never see teams hiring coaches in the middle of the season from the outside. If you're going to have an interim head coach, 99% of the time, it's usually someone within the organization already. You promote the offensive coordinator or the defensive coordinator, or you do something where the interim coach is already familiar with the structure in place and his coaching staff. Marv Levy was not, which is six days between the time he got hired and the day of his first game as a team's head coach, he had way too much to learn about the team. He had to do a ton of organizational things, from meeting with the coaching staff that he inherited, to meeting with other personnel to understand how things worked around here and how things would be structured. He didn't have any time for any of the things that coaches usually do throughout the week. In preparation for the game against the Steelers, Marv Levy watched a grand total of zero minutes of game film. In terms of his strategy for play calling, Marv Levy decided that he would call a grand total of zero plays, as he delegated the offensive calls to passing corner Bob Leahy and delegated the defensive calls to defensive coordinator Herb Patera. So if Levy had no input in the game plan beforehand and had no input in the game plan during the game, then did he do anything? Well, he did talk to the team in the locker room before the game started and he told them that as long as they weren't dumb and they weren't dirty, that they would profit. In other words, the only thing that Levy did all week from a coaching perspective was tell the team to not make stupid mistakes. He did absolutely nothing. And the craziest part about all of this? What happened on that day, for as little as Levy did, still counted in the record books as a win. November 9th, 1986. The Pittsburgh Steelers are traveling out east to Buffalo to take on the Bills in what is, all things considered, a pretty meaningless game for the standings. Pittsburgh enters this game with a 3-6 record, and would need to run the table and get some help along the way just to have a shot at the postseason, as they sit three games back of anything. The only reason why this game matters to the average NFL fan is because it is Marv Levy's return to coaching in the NFL. After some time in other leagues and some time taking on some other roles, for the first time since 1982, Levy was back in the NFL on the sidelines coaching. Although the general public did not know at the time that Levy was doing absolutely nothing in this game. Sure enough, the Bills won the game. Buffalo was in a tailspin, having dropped five of their last six games, and against the Steelers, at least for one Sunday, they were able to snap out of it, as they won this game 16-12. Buffalo dominated in the first half, and they led 13-0. A three-yard touchdown pass by Jim Kelly to Andre Reid opened up the scoring in the first quarter, and then there was a five-yard touchdown run by Rob Riddick in the second quarter. Buffalo dominated the time of possession, holding the ball for over 36 minutes. They held the Steelers to just 53 yards rushing on less than 3 yards per carry. They held the Steelers to just 185 yards of total offense. And the whole thing that Levy said before the game about not wanting to play stupid worked out, as the Steelers committed 15 penalties for 100 yards, while the Bills only had half of that. It was a great debut win for Levy, even though he did absolutely nothing. And after the game, Levy received a ton of praise from his players. Quarterback Jim Kelly said that Levy was a smart individual who was going to be a heck of a coach, and Rob Riddick loved Levy's style saying that Levy treated the team like grown men, and that his approach was a complete 180 from Bullis style. However, Levy made it very clear in the post-game press conference that he was way too busy with organizational stuff to actually do any coaching this week, and that in actuality, when it came to game planning for the Steelers, he did nothing. Still, I think it's safe to say that this win was a sign of things to come for Buffalo's success under Levy, because once he actually got around to coaching and doing things, the Bills became a force to be reckoned with. Hiring Marv Levy to get out of the basement of the AFC East was one of the best moves that the Bills have ever made in their franchise's history spanning over 60 years. Even though the Bills would stumble through the rest of 1986, finishing the season at 4-12, once Levy was able to put his stamp on the team in the late 80s, the rest of the AFC was put on alert. Buffalo made the postseason eight times in a 10-year stretch under Levy and made it to the AFC Championship game five times. Buffalo made four straight Super Bowls to start off the 90s. And while Buffalo would lose all four, to date, the Bills remain the only team in NFL history to ever make it to the big game in four consecutive seasons. By the time Marv Levy retired after the 1997 season, he easily had the resume of a Hall of Fame coach. He won 112 games in Buffalo, winning over 61% of the time, which is even more impressive when you consider just how bad the Bills were before he got there. The four-time AFC champion put his stamp on the team, and his legacy changed from a coach that had some trouble in the NFL with the Chiefs to one of the greatest coaches of his era. 
And there were some great wins in those 154 that Levy had. From the incredible comeback against the Houston Oilers in the 1992 wildcard round, to some overtime thrillers, to some tight playoff games. But it's hard to argue that he ever had a win that was easier than this one from a preparation standpoint. He did not watch a minute of game film. He did not have any input whatsoever in the game plan on the offensive or the defensive side of the ball. He did not call any plays. He was a head coach by title and nothing else, because he literally did not do a single thing outside of talk to the team beforehand about not making mistakes and not playing sloppy football. Considering just how little Levy had to do in order for his Bills to beat the Steelers, it's tough for a game to get any easier than that. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes, link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jrgator9, and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters helping out the channel, your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.